Okay, we're back, and we have our guest with us this evening, uh, Mr. Donald Farmer. Donald, welcome to Thank you. Two Guys Who Don't hey, Know Donald. Crap About Hey, Martin. How you doing tonight? Pretty Martin, good. good. My co-host. And uh, Donald is the illustrious director of several films. I forgot my list. Oh, oh hey, wait, here it it's is. It's actually right there. I have my list. You did not okay. forget it. No, mm -hmm. thank you, Martin. Okay. Oh, your and IMDb list. I IMDb list, yes. It's, it's my the cheat. Bible. Mm -hmm. It's my cheat sheet. And this says <laughs> that you have directed, wow. Uh, starting back in, what was it, 1986? And uh, we have Demon Queen, Cannibal Hookers, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Scream. Is there a numerical total there? There's tw uh, 20, 20, actually. Tw have you directed or co directed 20 films? Is that uh, correct? 21 or 22 now. I have three new ones that are shot but not edited. So Wow. Um, I don't know if you should count them until they're edited. Okay. Wow. Not, and if they're not on IMDb. They're not official yet. But that's mm -hmm. it's like the baseball guide record book mm -hmm. or something, you know. So, yeah, <laughs> and some of these titles are great. Uh, one one of my favorites. Uh, okay, the first movie, the first film I've seen that I saw of yours was "An Erotic Vampire in Paris." Yeah, which was made under my preferred title of "Vampire of Notre Dame," and so the title that it was released with is not my choice, but the. Usually, as it works out, that happens a lot. When you make a movie uh, and you license it to a certain distributor, the distributor has the final authority on using your title or changing the title for marketing purposes, mm -hmm. and that's happened to me a lot. I'll, I'll uh, give a film to a distributor, and when you give a film to a distributor for a certain number of years for a certain territory, uh, you know they have the calls on what the box is going to look like, on... Uh, what the extra features on the DVD are going to be, if any. Do you have the main title done, though, when you give yeah, it to Yeah, I'll have the main title done, and then uh, if they want to change it, they'll go. And so that really upset me on this one, because for Vampire of Notre Dame, I had a gorgeous main title done. I had this woman in France who was, who's been a graphic designer for MTV, and she's one of, an incredible graphic designer, and she made me a very intricate main title, which was custom fonts that she created on her computer, which were like uh, sort of gothic letters uh, crossed with uh, Salvador Dali where the letters seemed to be dripping into each other. Mm -hmm. And then MTI just ripped off my beautiful main title and replaced it with their quickly title that they probably whipped together in 10 minutes, you know, for Erotic Vampire in Paris. So every time I watch the movie, I'm very upset about, about my beautiful <laughs> title being taken off. Wow. That happened again with a martial arts movie I just did. The first of my movies to get really wide release in Blockbuster, I did this martial arts movie called The Strike, I mean, uh, Fighting Chance, and then when the, it was licensed for U.S. release, the distributor insisted on changing the title to The Strike, which hmm. makes people think I'm uh, Sergei Eisenstein because he made a film in the 20s called The Strike. Yeah. But I, I don't really uh, aspire. Uh, Makes you think of baseball or labor unions. Yeah, one way or the other. yeah like Fist or a Jimmy Hoffa movie. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm afraid people are going to rent it and think they're watching his famous film of the Russian Revolution. But I don't think it's quite the same. That, and that's because what the distributor just thinks they the have a better has, idea. They think they have the idea of what is a good marketing title, and they always think they know the best. And then there's other cases where I'll be making a movie with. Usually when you make larger films, I've made films usually in smaller budget ranges where I'm able to put the money together myself. And then sometimes I do them in larger budget ranges, like 100,000, 200, 300,000. And when you do that, I'm dealing with investors. And investors have final say on everything because it's their money. And so I just did a movie recently where, uh, with a local investor in Tennessee. And since it was his money, he insisted, that even though... I wrote the script. He insisted on he would be the one that would come up with the title for the movie, and I just really hate his title. I'm not even going to say what it is. I hate it so much, <laughs> but because uh, <laughs> I don't anyone, I want anyone to associate his awful title with the movie. And so I'm still fighting to get the title changed. I'm, you know, because so you're I, an independent filmmaker, is mm -hmm, that right? Yeah. Uh, sometimes I work for specific companies, like this company that. I did that film for, uh, I worked for them on four consecutive films. That was Stratus for Entertainment in Georgia. And so usually, you know, as an independent filmmaker, you're either looking for companies to affiliate yourself with and work for them as an in-house producer, director, writer, or you're looking to make the film essentially on spec and have a company lined up that will acquire the film. Now, that's what I did with Vampire of Notre Dame, which is what I prefer to call it because that's the original title. I made that film on spec technically, but I always did it consulting with EI all the, every step of the way. I even had an EI employee on set who was making sure that I would film it according to their guidelines because in, in the case of that movie, I was wanting to make the film for a specific distributor. I wanted to tailor it for them so that when it was finished, I would have a specific place to sell it. 
And that's usually a smart thing to do because if I know a lot of people who make films totally on spec, they don't consult with distributors when they make them, and then when they get the film finished, uh, they can have a lot of money sunk into them, but they can't unload them at all. I mean, there's a classic case a couple years ago here in Nashville. There was a, a local guy, I'm not going to mention his name to embarrass him, but he's, he won quite a lot of money on international chess tournaments. So he had quite a lot of prize money he'd won. He decided to invest this prize money into his first feature film. And he pulled out, he did not spare anything. He had 35 millimeter, he had a large crew using some of actors that I've used on my projects. That was locally shot here? Yeah, uh-huh. And it was a, you know, class production. I mean, I saw it and it looked beautiful, great photography, great production values, but a completely boring, unmarketable story. And so when he made the movie, you know, he'd spent, you know, a few hundred grand on this thing, but he cannot sell it to save his life because... Uh, you know, the story is totally unmarketable. And also, when you're spending that much money on a movie, there's a there's sort of a, a rule in independent filmmaking, which I tell all my friends, and which, you know, which is if you're making a $100,000 movie, you have to be able to, before you shoot one one day of work, you have to have a plan in your head, a game plan of how you're going to recoup that hundred when you sell the movie when it's finished. If you make a $200,000 movie, you know, you have to know up front, how am I going to recoup 200 grand? And usually people have a solid game plan. They may say, well, I'm going to recoup it by selling so much to pay cable like HBO or Cinemax or Showtime. I'm going to do so much with domestic DVD video, and then I'm going to do so much with international by selling around the world on a country-by-country -country basis. And, you know, you've got to have a solid game plan. And then really to, to firm up your game plan, it's good to talk to these potential distributors, your potential customers, before you make the movie and tell them, hey, I'm getting ready to make this film. Here's my script. Here's my cast. Is this something? you think you would be interested in buying? I mean, I, I know you can't give me a legal commitment right now, but I'd like to have an idea if this is something that your company would be interested in. So you have a vague idea if, the, if you're making a film that can be sold. But people like this guy who just make movies <clears throat> uh, totally with not, without consulting anyone mm -hmm. just make a film which maybe it's a story that they want to make, but they don't consult with anyone, they don't check with anyone, and then they're going to end up with a film they cannot unload. Okay, I want to get away from the business aspect of films, okay? Mm -hmm. I want to talk more about the creative aspects. Mm -hmm. um, you have moved into the, or you, you've been in and out of the genre of erotic films. Uh, the movie that I saw, um, The Erotic Vampire in Paris. Well, usually what I make are considered exploitation. A lot of my movies are considered exploitation movies or drive-in type movies or B-type movies. And usually the rule with those type of movies is eroticism or nudity is a part of the package that you want these films to include. Usually you want the films to have so much violence, so much gory violence. Do you have a quota that you have to meet? Uh, no, uh, usually the only time I've had a quota was when I dealt with EI. They, they're actually a company that will give you quotas because we shot a, we shot a rough, uh, we shot our, uh, my, my uh, director's cut of that movie, of Vampire of Notre Dame. I presented my director's cut to them and they told me to go back and shoot two more days worth of erotic scenes. So for them, they wow. did have a quota and I did not meet their quota, so we had to go back and Do make, more. so the final film that you've seen is not my preferred cut. It's actually got more eroticism in it than I personally prefer. Wow. Because uh, I, I really, that's really too much for my taste. I wanted it to be a little more discreet, and I wanted you to have to go about 30 minutes before you even saw any nudity, but they didn't really want that. So Okay. Well, I want to show a clip from that film. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, within the boundaries of what we're allowed to show on, on cable access, and uh, God knows. This is we, an erotic vampire. Yeah, God knows we love yeah, to Yeah, I should just say that when we, when we shot this film, this was a type of film I'd wanted to make for a long time, which was a type of film that was very popular in the 70s where it was these European horror films that were in the 70s was the early 70s was when you started seeing more and more nudity creep into films so in the early 70s there were some classic European erotic of horror films sort of like Daughters of Darkness and Vampires Daughters of Dracula and the Hammer films like Lusts for a Vampire and Vampire Lovers and on and on which had a little more nudity creeping in but these films always had sort of three key elements that made them unique they always combine eroticism with a beautiful European setting, with uh, lots of classic architecture, and then also dr covered everything, smothered everything with lots of classical music. And so that's mm. the three elements mm. I wanted to have in this movie. I wanted to shoot it on location in Paris so that I could have plenty of great architecture mixed with the eroticism, and then I smothered everything with Mahler. Yeah, and they gave you the budget <laughs> that you needed to go to Paris. And basically, the movie, the genesis of the movie was basically to make a lesbian version of Death in Venice. If you've seen the Visconti film, that was oh. what I was wanting to do. I, I like Death in Venice. I just wanted to make a lesbian version of it. I like lesbian movies. <laughs>
What what is what movie do you know do you know what movie we're clip we're going to see? It's an erotic see? vampire in Paris. Oh, we are going to see Vampire of Notre Dame. Dame. There we go, the French version. So oh. let's do that. Let's You're going to get us all confused with that. You might yeah. want to stick with the thing that people are going to put see that the money. Store. In. Yeah. Let's go ahead and show a clip <laughs> yeah, from that I'd look film. Look forward okay? to it. All right. Okay. Dear diary, today I met Isabel, and it's funny, but I've stopped having those dreams. It is a relief, but something doesn't feel right. I feel like I'm losing control. Is that bad? I don't know. She feels like everything to me. I let her touch me. I let her use me. I pretended it wasn't the first time. When I'm with her, time stands still. She said she would take care of me. But what else will she take? I don't have much more to lose at this point. Wow. <laughs> I'm I'm a big fan of Misty Monday. I got to tell you, I just <laughs> I'm head over heels in love with Misty Monday. And just briefly tell us how you met her. And now you had mentioned to me also that this that she was not under contract to Seduction Cinema. At the yeah, time. I, I filmed with her right before she got under an exclusive contract with EI. So now outside filmmakers like myself are technically not supposed to be able to hire her. Now she's supposed to be exclusive to EI. But I was sort of you know, walking down the middle of that road because when I hired her, even though I was not under contract to EI, I was tailoring my movie for EI and I was consulting with them every step of the way, saying, I know you're, uh, you're not, I'm not obligating you to take this movie, but I'm tailoring this movie for you, so give me all the advice on how much of this and how much of that you would like this film to have. And also the fact that, or even then, before she was under contract with them, she was their favorite leading lady. And so the fact that I was making her the star of my movie meant that this would be a movie of interest to EI. Mm -hmm. Misty's sort of branching, away, moving away from the erotic now. She's making movies that are more horror and just a little bit erotic. So her last few movies, Screaming Dead, Bite Me, which was a movie with very advanced stop motion animation, <laughs> spider attacks. Uh -huh. You know, she's she's trying to become more horror and less erotic. Uh, tell us your uh, website. We'll put the your website address. Well, on one the of my websites is designed for the, a film I recently did with Linnea Quigley called Miss Maniac, and that website is uh, members.aol.com forward slash Miss Maniac movie. Okay, we'll put that on the screen. We got that on the screen mm -hmm. as we speak. And um, what's your what's your other one? Do you have another website? That, yeah, that? I have another website which offers my films for sale along with other rare that's films, it. and that one is. Uh, members.aol.com forward slash vamp video, V-A-M-P video. Okay. And you can buy some of my movies there and some other films that are rare. Great. Cool. Okay. Well, it was fun having you here. I wanted to talk more about the, because uh, I love erotic films. I mean, I just, I mean. I oh, just, just Donald's wealth of knowledge and yeah. experience in the business yeah. end of it, too. It's sort of, sure. that, it's a lot to, yeah, lot we got to a, talk about. Yeah, we got a lesson in business, too. Yeah. So, but, well, I'm. I hate to break your heart, but I'm not making my last few movies have not been erotic at all. <laughs> so I'm sort of breaking the movie. You've got 20 films, and you got plenty. Of, <laughs> I just ordered two on. Yeah, uh, I mean, my Desaad movie that Martin knows about. It's just all talk. There's no nudity in it at all. Yeah. Well, but it, saw, it stars. Uh, we're both big fans of the star of it, Leslie Wallace. We, you know, she's Leslie really cool. Wallace. We yes. saw the play together. Yeah, yeah we did. Of course, yeah, Glenn saw the play. I too. In fact, I like her better than Misty. Leslie, Leslie can do no wrong. I do too. <laughs> Not me. The, let the battle you like, begin. You like Misty better, right? Leslie versus Misty. Misty. No, Misty I'll vote for Leslie. I'll vote for Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to go. Thank you, Donald, for thank being you. here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, thank Martin, you, Donald. Okay. Once again, we mm. are uh, wrapping up another segment of Two Guys, guys Who Don't, don't know, know Crap About, about movies. movies. Good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>